Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being with us today. I'm happy to see you all here on site and online. I think this is the strongest participation on site for the time being. Thank you, Jean Philippe. <laughs> I'm delighted to welcome Professor Jean Philippe Tiran. Uh, Jean Philippe is food professor and head of the Stigma Processing Laboratory 5 here at EPFL. Uh, his talk today is entitled Microstructure Imaging by Diffusion MRI Modeling, Simulation, Machine Learning, Application to Brain Imaging, and more. To give you an idea of what to expect, the seminar will last approximately one hour, with Jean Philippe presenting for roughly 40 45 minutes. Uh, Jean Philippe agrees to take your questions in line if they're urgent, but so just raise your real or virtual hand and we try to figure it in. Otherwise, put them in the chat and we're happy to take them up after the Jean Philippe's talk. Uh, before we dive down the presentation, uh, thank you, Philippe, so much for your time today. Thanks to the team for organizing yet another of these great Get to Know Your Neighbor seminars. And now, Philip, without further ado, floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Jan. You're welcome. Thank you for a very kind introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here, either in the room or many of you online. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here and to try to just show you a little bit what we are doing in the lab. Uh, so uh, as Jan said in the introduction, I'm the director of the LTS 5, the Mike Wonder Y5. We have only three LTS, but I have number five. I can explain offline if you wish. And I've been at EPFL for now exactly 24, 24 years. So uh, well, I'm happy to, to, to show you what we have done over the last few years. So I, I'm going to, to talk about uh, medical imaging and a special type of medical imaging, which is called diffusion MRI. Try to show you what we are doing in this domain, what we can do, what are the perspectives. A very, very, uh, a very quick word about the lab in general. So our research topics are computational medical imaging. So how to acquire, reconstruct, and analyze medical images with a strong emphasis on machine learning techniques and inverse problems. And also application to mostly diffusion MRI, but also ultrasound imaging and what is called digital pathology, which is the analysis of the slices of, uh, of tissues uh, by, by computers. We also have another part of the lab uh, doing a more computer vision, classical computer vision research on facial expression analysis, subject detection and tracking and some kind of other domains. But what I would like to discuss today is really MRI, which as you know, magnetic resonance imaging is now very well established as the most important modality when you want to study organs, complex organs like the brain, because of the fantastic contrast that you can get, and also some additional information that you can get with special types of MR sequences. And that's really what I want to, to discuss today uh, because really with the special MR sequence and the special processing that we can do with that, we can extract quite unique information about the tissue at hand, much more than what you see in a normal uh, MR image in, in a hospital. And this potentially has important implications in neuroscience and also in clinical practice. And that's really what I would like to, to do with you today. And I will start by introducing what, what diffusion MRI is and then show, show you a high level uh, information about the work that we do. I will not go into technical details, but I'll be happy to discuss that uh, either online or offline. So we are talking about diffusion MRI. So diffusion MRI, you have diffusion and MRI. So what is diffusion? You know, it's a Brownian motion that you get in any continuous medium when you have molecules that are not at the absolute zero temperature, they move naturally by the Brownian motion. This is known for, by these experiments that you have all done with a glass of hot water and a glass of cold water, you put a drink, uh, an ink of, uh, a drop of ink, and you, you have different uh, way to, to, well, you really see the brown motion by the mixing of the, of the ink at different speed. And so this is really the molecule, the water molecule diffusion that we experience in a continuous, hello, in a continuous medium, uh, can you just, uh, in a continuous medium like the glass of water, the diffusion is homogeneous, the same in all the directions, and it's only constrained by the container, by the glass itself. And uh, if you express that in statistical terms, which is the right way to do it, you can express the diffusion properties by saying, what is the probability density function of the diffusion? What is the amount of diffusion that you can expect at a, from a certain point after a certain number of seconds? And what is the direction of that? So you basically get in a continuous medium, uh, this, can, this can be described easily by a Gaussian uh, the PDF. So basically the distance from the initial position to the final position of any molecule after so many milliseconds is described by a Gaussian curve. It's very likely that we will stay around and it's less and less likely that we'll be far away. 
And the standard deviation of the Gaussian depends on the properties of the medium. If you have very hot water, the, the agitation is, is more. And so you will have a standard deviation that will be broader. If you have gas, the, the, the standard deviation will be. If you have oil, the standard deviation will be small because of the ability of the water molecules to diffuse easier in the gas than in, in, uh, in oil, for instance. So basically, the probability density function of the diffusion at the given point gives you some properties about the medium. That's just the physics of it. It gives you the properties in terms of the ability to move to a certain direction after a certain number of milliseconds. And it also gives you the direction of, of, of this diffusion. In a homogeneous medium, the diffusion is isotropic. It goes, it is the same in all the directions. There is a message in the chat. Let me just check if it's important or not. If you have questions, okay, very good. Um, so in a homogeneous medium, uh, we say isotropic medium, the diffusion is the same in all the directions and it is represented by a 3D isotropic Gaussian with the variance represented by this 2D delta. So basically it's represented by the D, the coefficients of diffusion, which represents the medium, how dense it is, how warm it is, et cetera. So function of the viscosity, the temperature, and delta being the time you wait before measuring the, the diffusion. The more you wait, of course, the, 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 the broader the, the diffusion. And so that, that is for the homogeneous medium. Now, what, why is it interesting when you are considering non-homogeneous, not non -sim so simple medium? Let's take the white matter of the brain. If you take the white matter of the brain, what you have inside in the middle of your brain, this is the part where you have all the axons connecting the different parts of the brain. So basically you have there an architecture which is made not as a glass of water, but as a large number, a huge number of small axons tightly packed together, creating bundles that connect the different parts of your brain. And if you remember your, your uh, biology 101 courses, those axons are surrounded by myelin, which is uh, a layer that makes them pretty much impermeable to water. And so basically inside the axons, the diffusion of the water molecules, the diffusion of the protons that were made of anyway, is much easier along the axon than perpendicular to it because of the myelin. So basically, while in a homogeneous medium, no, I keep showing here, sorry, you see my mouse, yes, do you, more or less? Uh, in a homogeneous medium, you had an isotropic uh, Gaussian distribution of PDF. In an homogeneous, in a medium made of fibers that are parallel to each other and tightly packed, the diffusion PDF will become elongated. So the diffusion probability density function reflects the architecture of the medium. It's elongated because the diffusion is easier in one particular direction and more difficult perpendicular to it. So the diffusion PDF reflects the architecture of the medium. That's the basic principle. If you have a crossing like that, you will have a PDF that, that reflects the, the cross. In a medium like the second one here, you can still model it as a Gaussian, but it's not an isotropic Gaussian. Or it's a Gaussian with some principal axes that are, that are uh, captured by, not by the standard deviation of the Gaussian, but by the covariance matrix. But it's pretty much the same, except that it has, pri it has privileged directions. Now, that's good. That happens. We all have have that in our brain. And the goal of diffusion MRI is to measure this PDF at every point of a 3D volume. So basically what you try to get is acquire 3D volume where at every point you not only have a grayscale pixel like you have in a radiograph or in a, in a computer tomography, but you have at every point the 3D PDF. And so you can see everywhere in the brain what is the orientation of the fibers, the fiber bundles at that location. That's the idea of the doing diffusion. And in the next slide, in the, in the next part of this talk, I will not represent those PDFs by their 3D representation like the, the one on the top, but more like a simplified representation with only the main directions. Otherwise it will become very difficult to display. And so how can we make MRI sensitive to diffusion? I will not enter in the detail of the sequence. I just would like to give you the intuition of that. MRI is based on the magnetic resonance principle. So basically, if you have a spin and you put it in a big magnet, it will basically align with the spin and we'll be able to resonate, to process at a given frequency, which is a function of the strength of the magnetic field, right? And luckily enough for us, for, uh, for the, the protons in a magnet 
of say one to three Tesla uh, of magnetic strength, this frequency of resonance is a radio frequency, some megahertz. So it's very easy to generate and to, to, to measure because it corresponds to the wave that we have for radios and so on. So the hardware is very easy to, to create. Now, if you consider this proton that is in a magnet and is able to process at a given frequency, that's how you can do a normal MRI. What we do in diffusion MRI is just one thing more. So I will not describe in detail this scheme, but the idea is this one. In addition to doing a normal MRI, where you see basically some physical properties of the medium as a whole, we want to make it sensitive to the diffusion, to the ability of the water molecules to, to diffuse, to move. And so what we do is that on top of what we do for a normal image, we add here, what you see here in the gradient of diffusion, we add a gradient of magnetic field, an additional gradient of magnetic field in a given direction. So basically in your big magnet, you use small coils to create a gradient in a direction that you choose. So a variation of the magnetic field in a direction that you choose yourself. But what happens? What does it mean? It means that since there is a difference of magnetic field along a certain direction, the spins that are located along that direction will resonate at different frequencies, increasing frequency. They will have a phase shift that will be strictly dependent on the strength of the magnetic field that they will see, okay? So basically that's what happens when you put that. And then when you have done that, you basically do the same, but you turn the gradient. You Technically you do that by what is called a 180 degree RF pulse and again, apply the gradient. What it really means is that you apply the opposite gradient. So normally if nothing moves, if no spin move, they have been seeing a certain gradient at the first shot and the opposite gradient at the other shot. So they should come back to the initial state. That's what happens if there is no diffusion. But if you have a spin that moves in the direction that you have decided for your gradient, it will see a certain phase shift at the first gradient. And then if it moves in between the first and the second, when you invert it, it will not come back to the initial state. You see, it will see another phase shift. And so at the end of the, the process, you will see a net phase shift that is not zero, that makes that you, your, all your spins that you will have at a given location much less synchronous, you change the frame. So that's basically the idea. If they move in the direction that you have set, you will see it, that's the simplest story. And so you can decide to measure everywhere in your volume, whether there is diffusion in this direction or whether there is diffusion in this direction or whether there is diffusion in this direction by applying this gradient and doing the measure of uh, gradient and uh, inverse gradient and see what happens. To make a long story short, that's what we do. And we get images that allow us to measure the ability of the water molecules to diffuse in the direction we want in at every location of a volume. Now, what has been traditionally done is to do that uh, measuring for the whole volume in six independent directions. Why six? Because if you assume that the diffusion is Gaussian at every point, it is represented, as I said before, by an anisotropic Gaussian PDF. And this anisotropic Gaussian PDF is modeled by, is parameterized by the covariance matrix. In 3D, it's a three by three matrix semi definite positive. So it has six independent values. With six independent values, if you measure the diffusion in six independent directions, you can fit those six independent values. And this is what is called, the, since uh, maybe almost 20 years, called diffusion tensor imaging, DTI. So you basically measure at every point of a volume, the ability of the water molecules to, to diffuse, you measure the PDF, the Gaussian approximation of the PDF at every point. And you see, this is an image of a slice called coronal slice of the brain. And you see at every point of this uh, brain, you see really the orientation of the diffusion. And to make it more visible for you, this has been colored in blue if the main orientation is vertical. It has been colored in red if the main orientation is horizontal. And it's in green if it's across the plane. And so you really see and recognize that there are fibers that are more or less vertical here. You have fibers that are horizontal here. And it's not a surprise. If you look at an anatomy textbook, you will see that indeed there is a big bundle of fibers that go from the spine 
to the brain. It's called the corticospinal tract. And that's what you actually see there. So with the diffusion MRI, you can measure the main orientation of the fibers. And the initial works that we have done in this domain, we're ready to exploit this uh, to really try to reconstruct the connectivity. This is the raw material that you get. I don't know if you see it well, uh, maybe, yeah. So you really get this orientation of the fibers. And the initial work that we have done in the lab was really to try to infer the brain connectivity. So we have this series of small peanuts. And the goal of the initial work that we have done in this domain was to, move, to go from the peanuts to the spaghetti. How to draw lines that basically, yes, I like food, of course, as you can guess. Uh, you go from peanuts to spaghetti. You draw lines that best interpolate between the, 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 pe the, the, the information that you get at every box. Then. So you try to find the set of lines that nicely go follow your, your, uh, your diffusion uh, PDF at every point to reconstruct what you think would be the path of the fiber bundles. And this is a quite complex optimization problem. If you, if you think of it, it can be uh, solved by different ways, but it's highly nonlinear. The simplest algorithm are called streamline, streamlines algorithm. And they basically initiate the tracking at a point, and then they follow point by point the direction of the main uh, diffusion uh, direction. And it creates point by point the lines. You create one line, two line, 100 line, 1,000 lines. And then you get that kind of representation of the whole brain connectivity from the, the local information that you have in the PDF to the global information that you have with those lines. And that is something we have done intensively quite a, well, 20 years ago already, and which was quite a significant contribution to the field of brain connectivity analysis. No need to say that. With this kind of technique, you get this information in vivo. You put your, your, your subject or your patient in the machine, and half an hour after, you get your data you can reconstruct. Before this technology, the only way to get access to the information of, about the brain connectivity was to ask your volunteer to be cut in slides. They rarely agree. Uh, so it was pretty rare to have information. It's true that it was very, very, it was very rare to have information about the brain connectivity because the only way, not joking now, the only way was really to work with cadavers and to try to track one neuron at a time. And you have billions of neurons in the brain, no way to do that. Here you have the big picture. Now, that's what we were able to do like uh, 15 years ago and, and be able to reconstruct some connectivity information between specific areas of the brain. I will not detail that here, but that was quite, quite successful. And this had, and today has a clinical impact. You know, it takes time to go from research to clinics. But today, in the software that the surgeons use for planning their surgery, you find tractography algorithms based on DTI, based on diffusion MRI, to really picture, to really map the big bundles and hopefully not to cut them too much when they operate. So this is the first translation from research to clinics. It, it took 20 years to, to, to reach the clinical practice. That's life. Now, we can do more. So that's, the, that's what we did now. And that's the, the, the beginning of the most recent part of our work in this domain. You can do much more with diffusion MRI. And that's the beauty. The story of that was that we wanted to define this tractography, so this ability to reconstruct the fibers that best explain my diffusion. We wanted to express it in a convex way, because for, uh, uh, before that work, it was recognized as an extremely complex problem that was highly nonlinear. And finding the fibers was really a, a complex optimization problem that was solved with uh, all the techniques that were uh, uh, present at that time for non-convex non optimization, like simulated annealing and very complex uh, uh, optimization techniques. And we really wanted to make this much more robust, much more convex, much more global. And so we came with this idea of using uh, inverse problem and, and convex optimization. We were the first one to propose this, uh, this, uh, this framework for brain connectivity analysis uh, some years ago. And the idea was quite simple. Finding the fibers is difficult. But it, if you have them, you can easily, from the fibers, try to infer what is the contribution of that fiber to the signal that you measure in your MRI. A given fiber will give you a given a piece of, of diffusion signal. So the idea that we said is that, let's imagine that we have a huge amount of fibers. We generate tons of fibers. We call it a superset of fibers. 
many more than what is real. So many, many false positives. Many are not real. But let's try to generate as many as we, we, we want or we can. And we, we fix them. And now our tractography problem is to remove those that do not contribute to the explanation of the thing. So basically, we have this huge set of fibers. We assign to each of them a weight. And we find the weights such that all together, each fiber with, the, with their weight explain the, explains the signal under sparsity constraint. So basically, that was formulated as a very simple linear problem. We, we first have to build our, our dictionary. That means that this is a huge matrix where each fiber contributes to the diffusion signal measured in each of the voxels where it goes through. So you have a fiber that goes, that goes across the brain. It contributes to the diffusion signal that, that will be measured at every point where the fiber passes. So basically, you write that as a big matrix where each fiber, vertically here, each column is a fiber, contributes to potentially the diffusion signal in each voxel of the brain. Many of them, they contribute with zero because they don't pass through this voxel. And those, where they pass, depending on their orientation, they contribute to a piece of the signal. And we say, OK, this dictionary, which is the dictionary of our superset of fibers, huge potential set of fibers, is multiplied by a vector of weights. And A times X should explain the signal that I actually measured in every box. So I just built a simple linear system, which is A times X should be equal to Y. What is the value of X that, X that, that solves this equation? And to regularize the problem, because A is largely uh, in condition, we regularize by saying we want to remove many fibers. We put far too many. We want to remove a lot of them that do not explain the signal. So we put a sparsity constraint on x. And so we try to solve the problem of minimizing a x minus y in the least square sense under the, uh, under the L1 minimization constraint. And this is a fantastically nice convex problem. It's huge because a is really huge, but it's convex and it can be solved very efficiently and it gives a global minimum. So that, that was really what we introduced at that time, which allowed us to really uh, overcome all the limitation of the classical tractography algorithms in terms of local minima, in terms of computational speed, uh, something like that was taking 45 minutes on a given phantom just to, to verify this, this kind of phantom here to, 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 to be able to validate our results. Now with our approach it takes 20 seconds. So basically it's, it allowed to reach a process in time that is compatible with clinical practice. And that was really the, the beginning of the idea. Let's make it complex. But then we realized that we can actually do more because what, what we now do is to, to write the problem as first a direct problem. What is the signal if I have a fiber? And then solve this, this problem, this inverse problem, to find what are the fibers that best explain my signal. So now we said that, OK, but we, we can take more, more sophisticated models for the signal. The forward problem can be more compl complex. It can, for instance, say that the signal that I will receive is not only governed by the orientation of the fibers, but also of the content of the voxel. If you have more uh, intraaxonal compartment, if you have more, more, more spins that are captured inside the, 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 the axons as compared to those that are outside, or if you have more extra water around, the signal will not be the same. So when we have this framework of convex optimization, we can really take the model of the signal as sophisticated as we want, and then solve to find the parameters of the model. And here in the first work that we have done, we have said that actually the signal that we measure has contributions from spins that are inside the axon, and we can have an analytical model for the signal that would be uh, generated by that kind of spin inside the, the axons. There are other spins that are outside, more free to move. And we can write the model. If we know how free they are, we can write what is the signal. And there is even free water somewhere in the brain. And so you can really write this forward model that the signal that you measure has different contributions. And if you put that in the convex optimization framework, that means that each fiber can contribute part of the signal that, is, that comes from inside the axon, part of the signal that comes from outside. And you can also add signal that is isotropic free diffusion. And so basically, by solving the same type of inverse problem, but with a more complicated forward model, 
you get access to more information. You get access to how much of the volume or your, your voxel is occupied by axons or by other types of tissue. And so you can measure now the density of your axons, not only the direction, but the density, how, ma how many, what is the fraction of the, 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 the brain tissue that you have at every point? Do you lose brain tissue after a stroke? Do you lose after a pathology? And you can measure how much, uh, what is the fraction of, of, of uh, cerebral tissue that you have in the voxel stomach? And so you can really build maps of the density, as you can see here, of the, what we call intraaxonal or intracellular tissue. So what is the density of the neuronal tissue in a given voxel? What is the density, the, the fraction of non-neural tissue in every voxel and the rest isotropic water? So now, not only the direction, but some information about the content of your, of your, uh, of your voxel. And you can even go further. It's quite intuitive to say that a small axon will restrict the diffusion more than a large axon. So basically, you can model that in a forward problem and come up with a method that will allow you to measure what is the size, the mean size, of the axons. And that is quite unique. I want to draw your attention on this because by solving this, this very specific inverse problem, you get access to an information of what is the mean size of the axons in your brain. An MRI has a resolution of one millimeter. An axon has a size of one micron, just to make it simple. So we have three, three orders of magnitude difference between the resolution of the MRI and the information that we manage to capture. Of course, we don't see the axons, but we get a signal that allows to stay in that big voxel, you have axons statistically in average of that size. And this allows to basically build maps where for each fiber you say, this corresponds to a fiber bundle with axons that are in average big or small. And you see in, that, in this picture, I don't know if you see it well here, but you have some of them are more uh, reddish than, than, than others. They are the bigger axons. And again, get, having access to that kind of microscopic information, this is why it is called microstructure, is quite incredible. You don't see it with the MRI, but you get a signal that is sensitive to the size and by invert, by forward modeling and then inverting, you get access to that information. And this allows to reconstruct really, in, the, in this movie that I will show now, you have for every fiber, virtual fiber, the size of the, the, mean, the mean value of the axonal diameter of those fibers. Red means big axons and blue means small axons. And this is for the fibers that connect the two hemispheres, as you can see. And you see there are big differences in axonal diameter. And this information is crucial to better understand the brain and can only be accessed by histology or thanks to, to the methods that we have developed. And this has been validated against histology. So basically, for instance, in a particular structure where, which is called the corpus callosum, it is known by histology that you have different sizes of axons different, at different locations of the structure. And this corresponds very well to what we measure. The, the, dot, the dots correspond to the experiments in human and in monkeys of real measures. And the lines correspond to what we measure with our, 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 our methods. And we have a very good agreement. So in, in summary, what we have, let me just check the time, it's okay. Uh, what we have here is just a simple, this is a very simple, a simple linear model to express the relationship between the microstructure X and the signal that we measure through a dictionary A, which expresses all the possible uh, combinations or variations of, of the architecture, if you wish. And by expressing this link between the real architecture and the, the, the diffusion signal, and by inverting that model by a simple uh, optimization, uh, convex optimization algorithm, we get back to the microstructure information. And this assumes, of course, that you know this A matrix, that for a given fiber, you can express the signal that you will measure, that the potential signal that you will measure. For a given fiber, what would be the contribution of that fiber to the signal? And so in the work that I showed just now for, the, for the, the diameter and the density, the model is very simple, it's analytical. If you have a, a big cylinder, you model your, your axons as cylinders. And if you have a big cylinder, you get that signal. If you get a small cylinder, you get this signal. 
But of course, the axons are not cylinders. They are not perfect cylinders. They are much more complicated. They are not sets of parallel cylinders. They are completely uh, interleaved. They have diameters that changes along the, the axons. So this kind of simple model has a limitation. You can write the A matrix easily for simple models, but it's, it becomes very hard to, to write them for more complex representation of the, of the, of the tissue. And so to build, to go further in this, uh, in this work, what we are doing now currently in the lab is really try to build this A matrix. So basically the follow-up model for much more realistic models of the brain architecture, not only simple tubes, but something that looks more like reality. And to do that, we have developed two, two very powerful tools. The first one, and I should present that first, and my slide is the opposite, so I will change if you don't mind. The first one is a way to generate realistic substrate, not only simple parallel cylinders, but something which is much more realistic. And that we have done by collaborating with colleagues and taking samples of real brains and segmenting, automatically segmenting, uh, the, the accents that we see in those physical samples. So basically this is cryo-electromicroscopy. And you see there, well, it's a very small sample. You cannot take a whole brain. But you, you, you take this very small sample, you try to segment as much as you can the real axons there, you measure their statistics, their location, and you use that to generate variations around that synthetic substrate that will explore the variety of things that might happen in the brain. So from real, real axons, you generate very realistic synthetic axons that will be used to build your A matrix. And this is something we have published very recently, as you can see. Uh, and when you have that, you can really generate very rich, very sophisticated substrate. This picture, the, the father of this picture is right here, but there is. Uh, he generates uh, substrates that are extremely realistic as compared to, the, to what you have in the brain. It's not stupid parallel cylinders. It's extremely realistic substrates that really capture the main variations, the main geometry that you have in a, in a, gray, in a white matter region. And when you have that, you can vary those parameters to create your dictionary. And for each of those variations, you can generate the corresponding diffusion signal to create your forward model. But in this case, you don't have any analytical solution for this signal. So you have to, to, to use a simulation. And that's what we have done. We have created what is probably today the most powerful diffusion MRI uh, simulator uh, that, that we allows you, if you give a complex substrate, to say what is the, the, the diffusion signal that you would get. So now we have all the ingredients to build fantastic for what problems. We can say, what are the possible variations of a natural substrate? size, density, whatever. What is the, the diffusion signal that you would get? So you can populate an A matrix, your, your forward model with very realistic uh, information and come with, uh, with uh, much more sophisticated information than just the mean average. This way to generate sophisticated substrate has also been used to validate spectrography. Spectrography, remember, the stuff that we do when we try to, to build spaghetti from peanuts, how to validate that it corresponds to a brain? Well, we have been able to generate very realistic phantoms, synthetic, but very realistic, and to ask the population in the world, uh, the labs active in this domain, to test their best stratigraphy algorithms on those extremely realistic phantoms for which we know the ground truth. And so that is a, an international competition that took place a few, a few weeks ago, actually, uh, and for which we had uh, quite a, a large number of the top labs in the world competing against each other. As organizer, we were not allowed to participate, unfortunately. So we cannot say that we are the best, but that's okay. Uh, and so I'm slowly reaching the end of, of this very high level uh, uh, talk. What we are trying to do in our lab now is really to have a closed loop. Basically, uh, what we want is to analyze the microstructure of the brain. To do that, we built very realistic models. That's a large part of, uh, of the work. So we segment real, real samples. We try to reconstruct. We generate synthetic phantoms and variations around them. We simulate the corresponding signals. And we have the inverse problem. And how to invert is convex optimization. But machine learning is also strongly coming there uh, because to estimate the parameters that best explain that, uh, machine learning is, is strongly uh, a candidate to help solving this inverse problem. 
And so when you do that, you get your estimation, you get your real patient, you put it in the machine, you use the same algorithm that with the dictionary that you have built and you get your result. We want to validate them and iterate to basically refine the MR sequence that will be, that will be most sensitive to some parameters that are important for some pathology, for uh, some populations. You want to be sensitive to some, some characteristics of the microstructure. What is the best MR sequence that will be sensitive to that and specific to that? Well, with this iterative process, you can really try to simulate what you want to measure, what is the response of your MR machine and optimize the, the sequence until you, you come to it. And just to finish, I would like to open the perspective to another domain, uh, not only the brain white matter, not only pathologies uh, of the brain, but also other types of pathologies. And recently we have an increasing interest in doing the same, but not for the white matter of the brain, but for cancer, cancer cells. And there is a parallel. If you look at a tumor, it's not very much like the white matter of the brain, right? If you look at the white matter, you have myelinated, myelinated uh, axons, as I said, so they basically restrict the diffusion perpendicular to them, and they are pretty small. While in a tumor, you also have cells, but the membranes of the cells are much more permeable to water. So the diffusion is much less restricted. So your diffusion signal will exist, but it will less be it will, it will be much less uh, restricted by the, the membrane. So it will be much less uh, constrained uh, and it will tell you much less about the, 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 the cell architecture. But still, we want to do it. We want to translate what we are doing in the brain to something which is much more complex, which is non permeable, uh, no, which is permeable cells, uh, and try to see how far we can go in trying to identify very early the presence of malignant cells in, in a tissue by modeling this permeability much more, by simulating this permeability, and again, by optimizing the loop that we are doing uh, to, to try to find the best sequence that will be sensitive to the early appearance of cancer cells in, in an organ. Uh, and my goal is really to kind of replace or at least minimize the need for real surgery, real biopsies, where you take a sample and you put it in the microscope. We want to avoid that and to be able to do much more to, do, to analyze much earlier uh, by a non-invasive way. And again, by applying exactly the same loop, we have samples that we can find uh, with the pathologists that we can model as synthetic models. We can vary them. We can simulate the signal that we will get. We can optimize our, our problem inversion, probably more and more with machine learning here because the problem will become much more complex. We will validate that so that at the end, we can have a patient and try to have a virtual biopsy, I really like a biopsy, but completely virtual. And that's the end of what I wanted to say. I would like to acknowledge the contributions of my team, Juan Luis is here, uh, and the rest of the team, and the colleagues from DTU, our main partner in Denmark, Siemens Medical, the SNF, and the, one, another center of the EPFL, sorry, yeah, the Center for Bioimaging, uh, which is a strong contributor to this work, and many more. And that's all for me, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for being here and I'm more than happy to answer your questions. So maybe uh, just let me say some words of closing. Thank you so much, Dr. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you in the room today and online. Great to see people again in person. Um, maybe next opportunities to meet us online will be this Wednesday for the EPFL CS RIC and AIP seminar series with Ishiro Takeuchi. Uh, you know, the seminar series was established uh, for last year with the RIC and AIP in Japan you know, to allow us to better understand what we are working on here at EPFL and what they are working on in Japan. And I understand they might be coming in end of the year yeah, to visit good. us, which would be great. Yeah. Then, we tried last year. Then next Monday, you have the opportunity, oh no, sorry, it's the 28th of March, you can, uh, come here again to meet Antoine Bosselu, and he will speak to us about what he's working on in his lab. So with that, without further ado, I wish you a great afternoon and hope to see you all soon again. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.